All right. Thank you for attending another week of our pro seminar speaker series. Um, I am happy to introduce this week's speaker again. This week, we are lucky enough to hear from one of our own. So um, Heather Prigiola is doing her PhD here at UNLV in the Department of Anthropology. She got her master's at Purdue University prior to coming here. She has been busy. She's already published an article in uh, Ecology and Humanism entitled Canine Ministries, Co-Instrumentality of Human and Dog in a Christian Ontology. She has a book out. The book is Monsters and Mythical Creatures from Around the World. I saw it. It's on Amazon. You can buy it. And uh, she has been doing a number of presentations. I'm not going to name all of them, but she's done quite a few guest lectures and presentations on similar topics on ministry dogs and multi-species religious practice, a case study on the improvement of rescue rates of dogs and cats at a municipal animal shelter. She has worked directly with animals through her volunteer work at a wolf park in Battleground, Indiana. So she has some experience working directly with animals as well. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over her, to her to talk about her Talk uh, Canine Ministries and the Post Domestic Inclusion of Dogs in Christian Religious Practice. And for those of you that are coming in virtually, please make sure you mute yourself. And any questions you have uh, for Heather as she's speaking, you can put them in chat and we will reserve the last 15 minutes for, for questions after she's done. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker, Heather Fajola. This topic, Canine Ministries and the Post Domestic Inclusion of Dogs and Christian Religious Practices, is the proposed topic of my dissertation. I'm still just in the early stages of this. So I've already been doing a lot of preparatory studies. Feels like I've been working on this a lot, but really I still have a long way to go. This is my first ethnography, so it's still a learning experience for me. So I'm going to be not just sharing a case study about a canine ministry. I'm also going to be um, talking about my learning experience as a beginning ethnographer. I'm going to be talking about the anthropology of animals and the anthropology of religion as well. It's out of the way though, I think. Uh, you might be able to just shove it all the way to the side out of your way. <laughs> right. Okay, so if you read the abstract on the flyer, there were some jargon words that I used, and so I will explain those first. Um, does anybody know what multi-species ethnography is? Audience, yes. Uh, would it be studying multi-species coming together in a cultural way, or the culture between two species coming together? Yeah, pretty much. Um, there is a uh, particular theoretical foundation associated with multi-species ethnography, but that's what it has to do with. Um, since anthropology is a study of humans, what it means to be human, and ethnography is a methodology for studying the human experience. Multi-species ethnography is uh, understanding what it means to be human by centering humans' interactions with other species. The understanding that humans are a type of animal, and just like other animals, we live in an ecosystem, we live in an environment with other species, and all species interact with each other in an ecosystem. And this is true whether you're living in a jungle or whether you're living in a city, in a built environment, or surrounded by other species. And other species aren't just animals, they're also plants and fungi. There is actually multi-species ethnography about plants and fungi, too. Uh, that these other species are subjects in their own right. Um, Western scholarship used to have this assumption where only humans are subjects and everything else is an object that you just view from the outside and act upon. And multi-species ethnography represents kind of a new way of thinking in anthropology, realizing that other beings, other life forms also have subjecthood. They have their own internal experiences, their own perspectives, uh, and their own uh, ability to act, interact, or react. Uh, interact with each other. Um, so the concept of multi-species ethnography is kind of a coalescence of influences from environmental anthropology that started in the 1960s and 70s, 
along with some uh, French uh, postmodernist philosophy, as well as some uh, indigenous worldviews, like uh, perspectivism and we'll call the ontological term in anthropology, about how animals view us. So, so multi-species ethnography asks, how is the human experience shaped by the non-human agent and vice versa? How do other species affect us? Another jargon word here that I use in the title is post-domesticity. Now, this one you don't hear as often. It's much more specialized, but does anyone want to guess what it means? Yeah, like I said, it, it's more specialized, but this is a concept that was uh, associated with Richard Boulier, if I'm saying his name correctly. And he came up with a model uh, of uh, pre-domesticity, domesticity, and post-domesticity. Now, as the word is domesticity, it's not domesticated. Domestication refers to a biological process where a type of animal or plant becomes genetically modified through many generations of artificial selection. So it's biological. Domesticity has more to do with how people interact with the animal. So in pre-domesticity, humans are interacting with wild animals. They may be hunting the animals for food, but they're not taking more than they need. They're not exacting control over the population, the, the animal population lives in a natural state. And oftentimes, I mean, we're talking about like hunting gathering societies, people often actually have social protocols in place to um, prevent them from overhunting. They might perform rituals to honor the animal's spirit, to, to give something back to the animals after, after killing them. So there's this respect and this reciprocity involved. But with domesticity, this is associated with uh, intensive agriculture, actually a large scale society. And humans exert, exert more control over captive animals, exploiting them for food and labor. And so you have more of a, an artificial divide being imposed between the human world and the animal world, and animals become rendered as objects for humans to exploit. And of course, towards uh, industrialization, this becomes more uh, intensified, or, or animals become more and more commodified. But something interesting happens with industrialization, factory farming, where, where now you have a society where the majority of people are not actually involved in animal handling practices at all. Um, the um, raising of livestock and their slaughter takes place kind of in specialized locations. Most people don't have anything to do with it. Even when we buy meat products, it's been modified so that it doesn't even resemble the original animal at all. And this leads to uh, what Boulier calls post-domesticity. It's a um, a, a mode of interaction where, where most people are no longer involved in that process and instead they're able to develop more compassion for animals and this is where uh, modern pet keeping is developed out of i call it the new pet culture uh, humans have had pets for thousands of years actually there was a recent archaeological discovery of an ancient egyptian pet cemetery but what i'm calling the new pet culture is what we're seeing in our contemporary times um, that is associated with um, some changes the, the the shift away from agriculture. You know, if the majority of of the uh, Western population is no longer involved in agricultural processes, you have more people moving to the cities and to the suburbs. People are still um, naturally inclined to interact with animals, but it's a completely different form of interaction. So, um, say a hundred years ago. Westerners had dogs and cats, but it was more common for those to just be considered working animals. You know, cats were supposed to kill mice and rats. Dogs are supposed to do some kind of work for you, whether they're helping with hunting or they're guarding or, or herding. Um, and it was common for children to play with the pets and be attached to them, but adults were expected to grow out of that. But it just took a few generations and uh, increasing suburbanization for uh, it to become normal for adults to become emotionally attached to their pets as well. And so kind of mid 20th century had this expanding suburbanization, this expansion of the middle class that was also associated with the New Deal. And several things changed in our society at that time. This was also when we saw an expansion of the evangelical movement in Christianity. And uh, that has coincided with this um, modernization of pet culture. Um, both changes are related to um, 
kind of a uh, product of uh, post-industrialism. We have scholars like Harriet Rigbo and Richard Gouvier and Adrian Franklin um, identifying this development of modern pet culture as being a result of the shift away from agriculture for, for most people. Uh, so now you have people uh, treating their pets basically like people, like family members, like children. You have people who are choosing to be pet parents instead of regular parents. You have businesses that are um, making changes to accommodate pet culture. So you have hotels and airlines that are accommodating uh, clients traveling with their pets. And this is just the way our society is evolving to be uh, inclusive of these certain specific special animals that are being given human status. So this is an example of post-domesticity. And during this time period of appreciation of companion animals is the recognition of the fact that uh, pets are good therapists. Too. So this is the development of animal assisted therapy. Um, there's been scientific research just showing some of the therapeutic benefits of interacting with companion animals, showing that, um, that, that they have a calming presence, you know, affectionate interactions with a, with a dog or cat or other friendly animal can help lower your blood pressure, reduce anxiety. Uh, children who have reading anxieties can actually read better if they're with a dog. Um, so you have people training therapy dogs or sometimes other animals uh, to just be therapy animals. And this is different from a service dog, by the way. A, a service animal has uh, training to serve one particular person who has a specific medical need or special need. Um, a therapy animal doesn't have that training. A therapy animal is trained to give comfort to various people, strangers in groups of people in public situations. So a therapy animal is trying to be comfortable. It helps to find one that's already naturally has that disposition, right? It's just going to be comfortable in public settings with, with uh, strangers and with groups. Now, as far as the domesticity, post-domesticity question, this can certainly go back to the use of animals for work. Uh, a lot of these therapy dogs are they're considered working dogs, and you have people putting in a tremendous number of training hours. Uh, you, you do have people who are making money off of animal assisted therapy, but that's just kind of one end of a spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, all pets are therapy animals. You, know, you come home to your pet after a stressful day of work and your pet greets you at the door. You know, your dog's wagging its tail, your cat's rubbing against your leg. You feel better, right? Makes you feel good. And, and presumably this is because you have a positive mutual relationship with your pet. And your pet also feels good to see you. Um, so now that animal assisted therapy has become more widely recognized, uh, you have some Christian outreach groups that are um, using that in social outreach. We're talking about religious nonprofits. A canine ministry is a Christian nonprofit organization that uses animal assisted therapy for social outreach. And these groups will uh, visit hospitals, nursing homes, people who have stressful jobs, people who have disabilities, people who are thought to need help in some way. They'll do crisis response, say in a response to a natural disaster or a mass shooting or something like that, where people just need to be comforted. And these ministry groups, they make prior arrangements, right? They don't just show up in random places unannounced. They, they make prior arrangements with wherever they're going, but they'll show up with their dogs and just see, usually the dogs are good at picking people out because they have that natural sense. They're good at reading people's emotions. I've heard all kinds of accounts, say, um, responding to, a, to mass shootings, for example, the dogs are good at spotting who's, who's the most upset. Um, and so in this photo here, we have a ministry volunteer in front of a church that serves the homeless community, a city that I, that I visited for my field work. This is a church that gives out free meals to the homeless. So there's this homeless woman in here. There's a ministry member ministering to her, and the woman is, is reaching out to pet the dog. Um, so you have this, this uh, species interaction here between the ministry volunteer, the dog, and the person being hosted. So what I've observed in these interactions um, is that the conversations will involve whatever the person being visited wants to talk about. So these aren't overt attempts to try to just convert people. It's not a, hey, you want to pet a dog? 
gotcha, now it's time to hear about the Lord. There's none of that bait and switch. Actually, they're very transparent about who they are. They, on the t-shirt has the ministry uh, logo on it with the religious uh, symbol on it. The dog's vest has a ministry logo on it. So, so they're not being secretive about who, who they're with, you know, what, you know, the fact that they're a ministry. They'll just talk to people. And um, if, if somebody opens up to them about a crisis that they're having, they might ask, can I pray for you? And what I've seen, oftentimes the person says yes. Sometimes they say no. And if they say no, the, the ministry member just is fine and they, they walk away. Um, so, yes, this is a form of Christian social outreach, which is uh, a, a type of religious practice that's that's gaining increasing attention from anthropologists. Um, these are acts of charity where, where uh, Christians will try to model Christ, do what Jesus would do, help those who are less fortunate without anything gained from the people who they're helping. So you have all kinds of charity organizations actually from, from all different denominations and branches of Christianity, but it's becoming a, it's especially popular among evangelicals. Um, but uh, because it's a do-it-yourself kind of practice, yeah, you don't have to necessarily be out of church. It's something that you can go off and do on your own. That's especially true of the canine ministry. So anthropologist Tanya Lerman noted that religious practices, whether it's inside of a church or outside of a church, is a way of reinforcing belief. A lot of people have assumed previously that practice comes from belief. You have your belief first and you practice because you believe. But Lerman uh, characterized belief as actually being something very deep. It's tied to personal identity and it's tied to your feelings. Uh, belief comes from feeling the presence of God. This, this, this real feeling, the realness of God, that uh, that feeling is kindled through practice, ritual practice. Whether you are praying, whether you are um, attending a, maybe a religious song and dance, or even just performing these acts of charities in an outreach context can all be uh, forms of practice that kindle this, this feeling that, that creates belief. And um, it's, so evangelical Christians in particular tend to be very much into these um, ways to find your own form of practice. Go out on your own and do it yourself. So canine ministries are popular because a lot of people have dogs. A lot of people like to do things with their dogs. And for those who feel a, a real connection to, to God and to Jesus, and they just really want to go out and do something to serve God, they also want to bring their dog along and have the dog serve with them. I mean, if that's your thing, why wouldn't you want to do it? It's becoming uh, increasingly popular. But I should also add a little asterisk there is that the word evangelical itself has generated some controversy because it's also developed certain other connotations, political connotations. And so even though anthropologists have um, identified a certain pattern, a uh, cultural pattern of trends and behaviors that are associated with evangelicalism, there are engaged Christians who participate in those activities who do not like that label. I'll just get that out there. I will talk about evangelicalism a little more, but, but with the understanding that I'm describing a cultural pattern of, of practices, it's not necessarily the word that, that every engaged Christian um, identifies with, which is why engaged Christianity is also a good term to have. Okay, so three functions of a ministry dog have observed. One, of course, they give comfort to people because they're therapy dogs, and that's kind of the basis of the canine ministry, make people feel better. They facilitate communication. There's been research here at UNLV that shows that being seen with a friendly dog in public makes you appear more approachable and makes people uh, more willing to talk to you. People who are maybe having a crisis but don't necessarily want to open up about it are more likely to open up uh, if there's a if there's a cute dog there staring at them like that one is, <laughs> um, and these dogs also carry symbolic meaning that's important to the uh, engaged Christians, which I will talk about in a little bit. I added the question mark more because I am just starting this research. I find out more. 
So my field work, I, I contacted a particular canine ministry and I was corresponding with them, telling them that I would like to do some research just to find out more about this is for an anthropology project and possibly might lead to my dissertation. And they were very open, very receptive. And he said, come on out here. And I went and visited them and uh, they gave me this t-shirt. So this is the, the ministry t-shirt. I blurred out the name because anthropologists usually keep their uh, informants uh, anonymous. But uh, the t-shirt was a very important moment for me because it meant that I'd been accepted into the community. And that's a very important milestone for especially a beginning ethnographer. Uh, when doing ethnography, finding your community is paramount. Being accepted by the community is essential. If, if you don't have that, then you actually don't have an ethnography. So this t-shirt uh, was kind of my golden ticket. I could start my ethnography and it also gave me access to spaces that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. It allowed me to engage in participant observation. So I'm not just this outsider following them around taking notes, but I'm actually shadowing them as they do what they do and helping them with it. Uh, this dog, incidentally, is not mine. I was just borrowing him for the photo, but he is a good boy. <laughs> so here are a couple of research questions that I had. What is the participatory role of dogs in the canine ministry? Again, remember in a multi-species ethnography, remember that animals too are subjects that participate and do things. How does the interspecies team interact with other humans? Uh, actually, in this ministry, they do use the word team to refer to the pairing of the dog and their handler. And that indicates that the, uh, that the people recognize the subjecthood of the dog, that the dog is a team member too. It's not simply a tool that the people are using. And how do these triadic relationships, meaning the relationship between the handler, their dog, and the person who they're visiting, transform the practice of Christianity uh, and the practice of practitioners' understanding of their faith? Meaning, how is the dog handler's uh, identity as a Christian and their form of practice uh, shaped by participating in this ministry and interacting with their dog? And I don't have like a, a short answer to that, but Next, I'm going to just share a, a series of observations that I've made. The thing that I'm looking at here is canine individuality. This is part of my multi-species ethnography here where the dogs are subjects. Uh, of course, each dog is unique and the, uh, the ministry members recognize this and they have their belief that, that God made each dog unique just as he made each person unique. I have uh, walkers telling me stories about how they uh, acquired their dog. They, they often believe that God picks certain dogs out to match with certain people, meaning that, that God recognizes and values the individuality of, of uh, each dog and kind of good matchmaking. Um, and I'm also noticing, of course, if you have dogs or if you have cats, you probably notice that each one is unique, right? That, that each animal has a uh, consistent set of behaviors that distinguish, distinguishes it from other dogs. Or from other cats, and um, that these individually distinct patterns of behavior uh, kind of dictate that animals' behaviors and interactions with with humans and with conspecifics in the same way that a human personality affects human behavior. And so I'm calling it a personality, and I'm not using quotation marks. You know, in, in academia and science, you're supposed to pretend that animals don't have personalities, but if you've seen it yourself, right? If you have pets, you know that they actually do have personalities. So I'm just going to call it what it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to have a series of vignettes in my in my dissertation, just profiles on specific ministry dogs. This dog here is an individual who I am going to call Oscar as a pseudonym, and I witnessed him do something in the field that was. Uh, very moving to me. This was uh, this was uh, in front of again in front of the church that serves the homeless community, and uh, he was brought by two chaplains. Who were visiting this man, this homeless man, who was having a serious emotional crisis. It's not the same man who's in that photo. There. This is a different person. Um, this man was drunk. He was crying, and he was. Um, telling the chaplains about all the problems in his life. He was kind of blubbering incoherently. He was having a miserable time. 
And his chaplains had already talked to him before. They had been forming a relationship with him. And, you know, they asked him to pray for you. And he was you know, fine with that. And they put their hands on his shoulders and they started reciting a prayer. And I saw Oscar come in between the two chaplains and stand on him. And Oscar was gazing into this man's face. And I was standing behind the man. And I saw Oscar's face as he was looking at the man's face. And I, I can't even put it into words. The, the look that this dog was giving this man was he, it's like he wasn't moving, he was just gazing. And it was, to me, it felt very comforting. And, and as, as this uh, man was crying, like he started quieting down, like the tears started flowing more, but he started quieting down as the chaplains were praying and, and Oscar was just, was, it, was just there for him. And uh, I was thinking like, wow, you know, Oscar must have been trained to do this. He must just know the protocol. He must know the drill really well. But to be honest, I haven't seen the exact same thing happen before or since because I haven't seen another individual who is having that type of emotional crisis since. Uh, and most of the time, Oscar will act like any other dog. Uh, he can even get himself in trouble just like other dogs. But if somebody is having a crisis, he picks up. So here's another, uh, another dog that I'm going to call her Bella. And this photo was taken inside of a 911 call center. So this is a place where people have very stressful jobs. If you can imagine being the person who picks up the phone when somebody dials 911, and you have to do this over and over again, all day long, and remain calm, uh, that's a very stressful job. So when these uh, first responders get off on their break at work, they come out of their offices, and they come in, uh, they line up in this hallway to pet this dog. And uh, Bella is quite a champ. I have seen her lie there calmly while being petted basically nonstop for 90 minutes by strangers. Uh, she's probably gotten to know most of them by now because she goes to that same location twice a month. But um, these, these people come out, they're stressed out, they'll pet her for a while, they'll, they'll talk to the chaplain, usually about dogs. It's usually what they talk about. And then they're done petting her and they go back to their office and they feel, they feel better. That's what it's time, time for the next one to pet her. <laughs> uh, but yes, Bella is the calmest dog. And, and I mean, I know if she was restless, if she was uncomfortable, the handler would, would recognize that and say, okay, she needs a break. But she's just fine with it. So now, as far as how different canine ministries operate, there are a lot of different canine ministries around the country, and they are mainly in the United States. And some of them are just local, uh, tied to a specific church, like a small operation. Uh, but there are at least two larger organizations that are more nationwide. And so I have reached out to two of these organizations, um, though I have more interaction with one than with the other. But there are some uh, differences in the way these groups are organized. So. Oh, I'll, I will outline that briefly. Uh, in one that I will just call Organization A, uh, it is tied to a specific denomination of Christianity. And so you have this central ministry uh, organization in which um, churches that are affiliated with that denomination can file to open a local chapter with that ministry. And then the local chapter will be based at church location. It's a highly structured organization, um, very centralized, very organized, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of rules and regulations. And whenever you have a dog handler going out into the field with their dog, they're always accompanied by a ministry partner. So you have two people. The dog belongs to the church. A chapter usually only has one or two therapy dogs, and it's not a pet. It just to the church. And the dog has over 2,000 hours of training to be a therapy dog. It's generally a purebred. Um, it also passes the canine good citizens test. But with all that training, this dog is able to go visit almost any location and it's able to work with um, a multitude of different handlers. So there are going to be several handlers in any of these local chapters who, who might take this dog someplace. And in any given month, actually in any week, 
one dog is going to visit several locations. This is uh, quite different from uh, organization B. Organization B is non-denominational, not tied to a specific church. The founder of this organization identifies as evangelical. And although not all the chaplains in this organization also use that label, some of them distance themselves from that label. The way the founder designed the organization reflects the cultural uh, trends uh, and, and uh, practices associated with evangelicalism. So that in particular uh, is especially related to uh, individualism. So you have a lot of um, a lot of openness, a lot of uh, say that the individual members get to have. So the structure of the organization is a lot more relaxed. It has a structure only as much as it needs. Just individual members operate within their own city. They, they keep in communication with the, uh, with the board members of the ministry, but they are basically, they, they don't need anyone shadowing them. They get to choose where they go with their dog. And the dogs in this, in this group are the, actually the pets of the individual members. So you have a very close personal relationship between the dog handler and their dog because the dog is their pet and their family member. They are attached to their dog the same way you are to yours if you have one. You know, this is a dog that lives at home with them, probably sleeps on their bed. The dog is a member of their family. Uh, these dogs pass the canine good citizens test in order to become certified and approved for this work, but that's the only certification required. We don't have that additional 2,000 hours of training. Um, so a given dog in this, uh, in this ministry might not necessarily do well in absolutely any and every scenario, but it's understood that the handler knows their own dog and knows their dog's strengths and weaknesses and limits, and is going to only bring that dog to places where that dog will be comfortable. Like for example, some dogs are great with children. Some dogs are nervous around children. Some dogs are great around other dogs. Some are nervous around other dogs. You know, so it's up to the handler to know their dog and uh, judge, okay, I think my dog will do well in this location. They bring them, if the dog does well, then they're probably just going to be visiting that same location on a regular basis instead of taking them to many different locations. So my field work has been with organization B. Um, they are a lot more open and accessible. Uh, I will be learning more about organization A as my research continues. But organization B is going to be the basis of, of my field work as it has been already. So yes, these are this is the non-denominational group, the one that has the more evangelical uh, design at its base. So here is a quote from the newsletter of that organization. Our mission is to have the love of Christ shine through us and our canines, his disciples, by providing a ministry of presence that actively engages with people who need the love, hope, and compassion God's message can provide. There are at least a couple of, uh, at least two interesting things in here that I want to point out. It's in the first line. The love of Christ shine through us and our canines as his disciples. Who are his disciples? Us and canines. The dogs are disciples of Christ too. And the other part is the ministry of presence. And that is a concept that's also especially associated with evangelicalism. It's the idea that any Christian believer can practice ministry outside of the church uh, by being present for others with comfort. It's based on the belief that God is present and his presence is comforting. Any believer can do the same. Um, but if giving comfort to people is the basis of the ministry, what, what is it the therapy dogs do? They give comfort for people. So, so dogs are naturally well suited for this kind of work. Dogs are great ministers. And some other reasons why dogs make great ministry partners, the beneficial effects of canine assisted therapy, which has been studied in a scientific and medical context before, can be interpreted in a spiritual way, which of course is how, how these ministry practitioners interpret it. Uh, and the affectionate behavior of the dog is also interpreted as unconditional love which is compared to God's love. In other words, dogs embody certain values that Christians idealize. But here's a quote from one of the chaplains in this organization. Animals can show what is called unconditional love. 
people, humans, we judge people. That's the unfortunate nature of a human being is that we judge people. Dogs don't do that. Dogs love you for who you are. And that's a beautiful testimony to show people how we should be doing the same. We should be loving people. God says that in the Bible. So here is the sense that not only are dogs so morally good that we should be modeling them. Here's another quote by another chaplain. And that's what God shows us more than anything else is love. So I really believe that God works through the dogs because they show the love and compassion of Christ to people and unconditional love at that, which is pretty much Christ-like. And, and I'm not asking questions about, oh, well, what about the dog that does this bad thing or that bad thing? I'm interested in how the handlers in the ministry interpret the dogs, how they interpret the dog's behavior and especially frame it within their belief system. So yes, dogs are thought to have certain idealized traits, but they are loving, they are loyal. Of course, loyalty is an important concept in Christianity. You know, a good Christian is loyal to God. Obedience is an important concept in Christianity. And that they're seen as innocent. Um, you know how people kind of make excuses for their dogs? You know, if a puppy rips up a, a slipper or something, you know, it's always kind of portrayed on television as just kind of like a cute thing. You know, we have this society where dogs are just thought of as as children, and they're just so innocent and sweet and good. This idea that they are morally good and that they don't sin. Even if they misbehave, it's not sinning. And again, one of the chaplains actually told me that dogs don't sin, that humans sin, and that's why they need to be saved by Jesus. But dogs are basically already saved. Now, another interesting thing that I notice is this talk about uh, using the dogs, which on the surface, sounds like domesticity and exploitation. You're using it for something. Maybe the military members talk about using their dogs for the work. However, they also talk about themselves being used for the same work. In uh, Christian social outreach, a lot of these engaged Christians say that they are acting as an instrument of God or that God is using them. And they will say this very proud, too. It's, it's, it doesn't have a negative connotation. It's something, it's something to take pride in. Um, and this actually makes me think of post-humanism, too. If uh, there's, there's actually some agent you know, outside of the human, where the human is not the center. Right? Um, here's a couple of quotes. So from the ministry pamphlet literature, using ordinary people and their beloved dogs to share God's message of love, hope, kindness, and compassion to the I asked one of the chaplains, you know, so you believe God is using you? He says, God is definitely using us as a chaplain, as volunteers, as a minister to minister to people. He puts us in situations. That's why we're in this. God uses us in conjunction with the dogs to minister to people. So the idea that instead of this just being a world where humans are at the top and they use all the animals and exploit them, humans are more kind of on the same level as, as other animals in this way. Well, when they serve God and they have animals serving alongside them, uh, be an instrument of God and for the dog to be the co-instrument. Co-instrumentality became uh, a key word that I published. And uh, this idea uh, blurs the concept. The binary of subject and object isn't necessarily an oppositional binary. A person can be a subject and an object simultaneously. So is the dog. And all of this is just a reminder to the Christian practitioner of their own subordination to God, which again also kindles that belief. The idea of kind of assuming this subordinate position, and you know, the traditional idea that animals are subordinate to humans, that humans are subordinate to God, and therefore the human is more like the animal relation to God. This is actually not a new concept in Christianity. This relationship with dogs is relatively new. We have this new pet culture. And back when the Bible was written, dogs were not thought of in such a positive way. Actually, the few places in the Bible where dogs are mentioned, it's more in a negative context. But there were other animals, specifically one kind of animal mentioned frequently in the Bible that carried the same moralistic connotations that we attribute to and that animal is the sheep. Because back in the time that the Bible was written, a lot of people herded sheep. 
So they had this close personal relationship with their sheep, the same way people today might have with their dogs. And so there are many references to sheep in the Bible, oftentimes comparing sheep to people or vice versa, but in a positive way. Uh, now today, of course, we have different connotations to be compared to a sheep is not so positive. Uh, but, but at the time, um, you know, you had this concept here, the Lord is my shepherd, is a common phrase that a lot of Christians still say, but it's this idea that, that we are like sheep to God, but that this is supposed to bring us comfort because it means that he will lead us and take care of us. Um, I've actually seen um, members of these canine ministries say that um, we depend on God the way our dogs depend on us. So it's this comparison of, of people to the dog or to the sheep. There's also this parable of the lost sheep, which is illustrated in that painting where Jesus rescues a little lamb. Of course, that's a uh, metaphor for a person being saved. You have uh, a passage in Matthew where uh, it said that after the second coming, Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are the, uh, the righteous Christians and the goats are the sinners. So this, th these metaphors in which the animals are people, vice versa, uh, you have always this, there's this one type of animal that embodies all these morally good traits. So when people used to work with sheep all the time, the sheep was the morally good animal. Now it's the dog. I had one of my interlocutors tell me, and she, she was speaking from a believer's perspective, that, that God uh, speaks to us through the animals that we take care of. And so uh, people used to take care of sheep, now we take care of dogs. So just some other ideas that I'm putting together here. If, if this interaction with, with morally good animals helps to solidify the uh, beliefs and the Christian identity of the, of the handler, um, the canine ministries are a practice that can serve to reinforce and express one's beliefs and identity, Christian believer and a Christian citizen. I'll talk a little bit more about Christian citizenship briefly. Uh, the Canaan ministry is also a new opportunity for engagement or social outreach. It's another option for those who are seeking to be socially engaged. Um, if you have a dog, if your dog passes the canine good citizens test, this is another option for you. Uh, and it's an opportunity to be seen interacting with a saint-like creature and it is a religious experience for the handlers. Uh, again, as I was in the field observing these interactions, it's not always a religious experience for the person being visited. It, most of the time, it seems like the people being visited are just happy to be petting a nice dog. But to the handler of the dog, it's a religious experience. Uh, in my interviews, I asked uh, several chaplains, have dogs helped you become closer to God? And all of them said yes. Now, as far as... Um, this question of uh, Christian citizenship, this is something that I'm just starting to look at. This is an idea that I actually um, was talked about by, by uh, Kevin O'Neill, an anthropologist who did work with evangelicals in Guatemala. And in countries that are democratizing you, and where you have the presence of evangelical Christianity, you have individuals who kind of meld their identity as Christians with their identity as citizens within the country and that the, uh, the two identities are kind of connected. And uh, he specifically linked that to um, democratization of the South. But I think that a similar concept exists here in the United States as well. Um, this is why it's so hard for a lot of people to separate religion from politics, because a person's religious identity, their identity as a Christian, their identity as a political citizen, it's kind of hard for them to separate. And uh, because you're just you, right? And that's just who you are. And, um, and this is especially common in evangelicalism. Uh, but I guess one question is then, you know, God can be a, a Christian subject, can they also be a Christian citizen? Are we, you have the canine good citizens test. Black citizens, you know? <laughs> um, so yes, about the dogs. They are active participants in the ministry, full present in the ministry of presence. They, uh, they are individually distinct, and that also uh, makes the, each uh, ministry pairing and each individual practice distinct. Uh, this research invites questions about subjectivity and selfhood, not only about the uh, handlers of the dogs and how their interactions with the dogs uh, reinforces their own sense of self, but also, of course, questions about the selfhood of dogs as well, how that is framed in a Christian belief system. 
Um, and yes, the, uh, the question of dogs being included as Christian subjects, whether or not they're citizens too, I do not know, but I do see this as a, uh, an example of post-domesticity. and go back to see if we have any questions in chat um, before I ask questions. Does anybody out virtually have questions? We got little claps. Anybody in the room have questions? Uh -huh. I have a question. You said like if um, dogs are like kind of associated with like being like loyal, innocent, and all those good traits. Why does it have like a negative connotation to like other people? So, like one example is that I hear like, like if you were to say that to someone, someone might say like, oh, they're dumb, like they don't know anything. So, like, why do they have that negative connotation to them? Excellent question. All of these connotations are cultural in nature. They are ascribed by people. So it's not something that's inherent to the animal that's universally recognized by all people. This is something that people learn to associate with the animal. So in different cultures too, you know, or, or different, you know, subgroups within the same country, you will have different attitudes, but a particular culture or a subculture will promote certain connotations. Um, so for example, you know, you might have this, um, idea that dogs are loyal and good and well behaved, whereas cats are diabolical and nefarious and they misbehave on purpose. However, in Islam, you have kind of the reverse where, where cats are the favored animal and dogs are seen as dirty. Right? And it's it's really it's not something that's inherent to the animal. It's it's just people's interpretations. Like it's not like the who are the society like of those people. Yes. Yes. So when I was talking about the new culture this also represents the development of new connotations. So the idea that pets can be family members uh, and, and, and children, um, it is a new set of ideas. So new, new ideas, new attributions can be developed almost spontaneously. Oh, well, I have- You can take that one first. Yeah, I think, uh, I think James has a question. Hey, can you hear me, Heather? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so um, great presentation. I, I had a question on the, the history piece. So you, you mentioned um, the the lamb and the goats uh, as part of a, a historic um, way in which animals were part of, um, uh, I guess, as part part of different types of religious practices or, or used as metaphors and whatnot. Were there other, did, or did you come across or do any research on other ways in which animals were, you know, potentially historically uh, used in such a fashion? And I guess what comes to mind is like, did the apostles, you know, or Jesus himself, you know, have any, any pets? Like, is that completely ruled out in both Catholicism and and within Protestant, you know, belief systems. Um, and I guess what comes to mind as a Catholic myself or raised as a Catholic was, uh, uh, you know, the saints. So there's like St. Bernard. And I know that that Bernard was a, a monk that had established a hospice. And there was a specific dog breed that was used. And then that's where the, the name St. Bernard comes from, is from, from the use of dogs at the hospice. So just wondering if you had come across any other historic examples of, of such ministry, pet ministries. Uh, I actually have not looked into that. I know that there are certain saints and apostles who have certain associations with certain animals, especially with, uh, with dogs. And I know there was a pope, I don't remember which pope, who declared sometime during the time when uh, Christians were, were uh, conquering, you know, polytheists in Europe and, and converting them. There was a Pope who declared it to be um, a sin to eat heat because the, the, uh, the pagans, the heathens would, would eat horses. 
uh, there was this kind of uh, an association of horses became seen as a good not supposed to eat. That was the only, the Bible doesn't actually have any prohibitions on specific animals once you leave, um, once you get to the New Testament. You know, uh, of course, in the Old Testament, there's prohibitions on pork, shellfish, it's associated with Judaism. So there's there's been research on that and how the uh, food taboos changed uh, after after uh, the Christ. But uh, as far as, uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody wrote about that. I mean, well, I don't know. No, I haven't looked into that. I know that the attitude towards pets and pet keeping has changed a great deal over time, space, and um, so I wouldn't necessarily expect things to be. Okay. I don't know if Jesus had a pet. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. He had a dog. I think. I think we know he would probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, donkey. First, yes. Oh, um, you briefly mentioned that I think it was Organization A had a preference for purebreds. Yes. Is that a trend in multiple organizations? Because you mentioned um, that there's kind of this view that dogs are already safe. Is there like a difference of opinion between like purebreds, mixed, or even like adopted versus? Not adopted. Great question. Um, I am hoping to have some and schedule some formal interviews with Organization A. Um, I think that I know if you're training any kind of work dog, you kind of want to know its pedigree. You kind of want to know where it's come from. Um, but in Organization B, um, again, a lot of them do have purebreds, but not all of them. And some of them have rescue dogs. And each each person kind of has their own story about how they got their dog. And sometimes it was just circumstance. Just will tell me these incredible uh, accounts of how they just this dog just kind of popped into their life unexpectedly. Sometimes it's a, it is a rescue dog. Um, they don't they don't always seek a particular breed. Um, Oscar, who I showed, is a mixed breed. But the majority uh, in organization, the majority were purebreds or designer breeds. But but there was a much wider diversity than what organization A has. I think that was related to my question was, is there a preference to actually rescue the dog as part of your kind of Christian outreach rather than buy a dog from a puppy farm, say, um, but maybe you haven't had those discussions or that doesn't figure into the origin story. It doesn't matter. Um, well, again, I've had different individuals tell me, I mean, I have never heard of anyone buying a dog from a puppy farm. Mm -hmm. uh, some people would get them from others, but, but a lot of times, the dog would just come to them somehow. And only dogs are moral. You can't be co instrumental with like a therapy iguana. Um, I don't think that's true. I mean, I haven't heard of a therapy iguana. Okay. Uh, somebody, a couple of people were telling me about a therapy pony. Um, and I think that different individuals also just have different preferences. Like, say, say attitudes towards cats really do vary. Mm -hmm. We'll have, we'll have, you know, Individuals who love all animals have individuals who only like dogs. I don't think that there's necessarily, of course, these or these these ministry groups are canine specific, but um, the idea that only dogs are moral, I, I don't think it's limited just to this. Mm -hmm. Except maybe there might be some individuals who think so. Okay, somebody asked, have you experienced anyone who had trouble with the concept of co-instrumentality? I know that some people have a huge superiority complex over animals. So in explaining this concept, have you received any pushback on it? Truthfully, I haven't really explained that concept to my interlocutors. I'm just listening to them and I'm forming a theory based on what they're telling me. And um, I think, uh, so does that, does that answer your question? Um, okay, but it looks like, so, Lewis was a professor of mine in undergrad college. And she is <laughs> Hi, Heather. That was great. I really enjoyed that. So I just started thinking, um, most people who have pets and dogs mostly think of them as children. They kind of infantilize them. And it seems like in, in this context, they're making adults out of them almost. So I'm wondering how people 
talk about their children or talk about their dogs as mature, like the level of maturity or something like that. And I don't know if, if within Christianity in general or within evangelical Christianity, if children are considered to be disciples. Um, I don't really know, but I'm just curious about how people talk about their dogs as members of their family and in relation to their children and whether you picked up on anything like that. I haven't had very many conversations about children other than some of them like to visit children. Of course, if, if you do think about Christianity, oftentimes we would see images of Jesus as a child. You have this idealization of childhood innocence. There is this uh, moralization of the innocence that's associated with the child. Purity. So I right. think right. to that to that extent, the extent to which dogs are thought of as models of moral goodness that, that we could be emulating is related to their perceived innocence, which is a quality of, of the archetypal child. Child. Okay. So there seems to be sort of this tension here between the kind of childlike qualities of the dog, but also the responsibilities of the dog as, as an adult. Um, I'm not sure if the participants, if the members would see it as a tension or not. No, I, I don't know either. I'm just, yeah, but okay. just to me, it sort of struck me. I don't I mean, maybe they don't, but, but it still might be there. Maybe. And it might depend on the individual. I, I haven't heard anyone bring up like a um, disparity between childhood and adulthood in application to dogs. I mainly just hear a dog and I are serving God together. Yeah, it might be something to kind of listen, listen for as you continue with this very interesting project. Yeah, I have a question. It might be a bit strange and out of field, but would they, I mean, it's a bit cliche as well, but do they consider the dogs to be found in heaven? Because you mentioned earlier they were co-instrumental as well as, I mean, very spiritually linked in general and also already saved, quote, on, you know, would they, do, do they expect to find God's, uh, dogs, excuse me, do they expect to find dogs in heaven or in the afterlife? Like, how deep does the spiritual connection go? In dogs go to heaven. Yeah. Of course, that is, and he would say yes, right? Yeah. Dogs go to heaven. I did ask that question in my interviews. And, uh, and so traditionally, uh, you know, in Christian orthodoxy, dogs do not go to heaven. Although the Bible doesn't explicitly say whether they do or don't. Mm -hmm. And so because of that lack of specification, you do have an increasing number of Christians today who believe that they do. And you have people saying that if I can't see my pets in heaven, then it's not heaven. And in my interviews, I, I got all kinds of responses. Some said, yes, I believe they go to heaven. Several said, um, I'm not sure, or I hope they do. The only one said that she doesn't believe. So it is across the board. The one chaplain who said that dogs are already saved, he does believe that they go to heaven. Thank you. In here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm curious, did you ever reach out to any of the ministries that don't partake in the canine therapy to see what their outlook is on how they view dogs and if they like view them this on, on the same tier? these other ministries that do partake in the canine therapy. So just uh, non-canine ministries. Right. How they would view the dogs. Well, and, and those dogs in particular or dogs in general? Um, well, because you mentioned how they, the ones that do partake in the ministry and the dog therapy that, that they on this tier, like where they model behavior and they're like, they're better than the humans. So I'm just <laughs> kind of curious on, on how the other ministries that don't have this, um, therapy animals, how, how, yeah. what their opinion would be. I mean, that almost sounds like um, could be a whole other dissertation. <laughs> General attitudes towards dogs in Christianity broadly uh, could probably generate such a diverse range of responses um, that, that is outside of, of my, uh, my here. <laughs> no, but maybe right now, yes, yes, right now. 
It's your post doc. <laughs> yes. Another one from James. Famously in the Bible, Jews referred to Gentiles and sometimes as dogs. Yes. Are these canine ministries reclaiming the dog Gentile identity? Shot into it. Right. Uh, well, as I had mentioned, that the, the few places in the Bible where dogs are mentioned, it is usually negative because attitudes towards dogs back then were a lot different from how they are now and actually probably more similar to Islam and in Islam dogs are often thought of as dirty. The, um, the very positive associations with dogs are recently. Developed. Is that related to uh, claiming a Gentile identity or if you're uh, uh, implying trying to distance Christian Christians trying to distance themselves from Jews. I don't think they're putting that much thought into it. I think I think it comes from having a personal relationship with a dog. And just loving your pet so much that these positive associations just come from that relationship. I don't think they're trying to distance themselves from Jews. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, I think that will be it. And I want to thank our speaker, Heather Pajola, one more time for sharing her work with us. Thank you. And uh, have a good rest of your Monday, everyone. We'll maybe see you next week. Thank you.